Welcome to Common Grounds, a connect group of Sagemont Church, Houston, Texas. Thank you for joining us for Go Tell It on the Mountain, a study in evangelism where we learn to share the good news to the world around us. All right, 1 Corinthians 9. This is a great chapter about Paul's evangelism strategy, a little bit of insight into his motives and how he did things in the way of evangelism. I think if you're going to do evangelism training, I think you start with the Word. Amen? How things are done on the Word, how Jesus did things, how Paul did things, what the Word says. That is the best evangelism training we can have. And then, of course, there's other things that we can learn as well. But we got to start with the, the, the base is the uh, philosophy and the, the mindset of the Word. So I'm, I'm thankful for our class realizing that and starting out there before we do some practical stuff. And times are changing. Methods change. And we're going to talk about that today. Paul used different methods in different places. Uh, you use different methods with different people. I think different cultures have different methods as well. I'm going to talk about that when we get to the first, second half of 1 Corinthians 9. So we know Corinth was one of those towns that Paul visited because he saw a man in Macedonia saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after they went to uh, Philippi and Macedon, they went to, over to Thessalonica and they went on down to Corinth eventually. So God kind of redirected Paul's missionary journey, even though he was thinking Asia, which was Turkey. And it sent him over to Greece, and he ended up um, taking the gospel to what we know today as Europe. And see a lot of books in the Bible come out of that. It's always best to let God lead you. Sometimes we have a, a mindset of where we want to go with ministry and how we want to do ministry. And you have to make plans. It's good to make plans, but you also, uh, I think my mom said it this week about somebody said something about this. Make your plans, but make them in pencil and give God the eraser. You know, make plans, but Freeman, Wednesday night. All right, credit where credit's due. That's a good That's a good little saying. Make your plans, make them in pencil, and give God the eraser. Because God erased Paul's plans. You know, he's the great apostle Paul. And sent him somewhere else, and God had a much better plan than what Paul did to reach the nations for Christ. Now, it wasn't easy for Paul. These people at Corinth were, were a little crazy. They're coming out of the world. They're coming out of a crazy culture. Uh, sinful culture, and uh, they're going to take that some with them into the church a little bit. It's going to take a while to get these guys cleaned up and discipled, and some of them end up attacking Paul. So we're going to look at, at the first half of 1 Corinthians 9 here and how Paul has to defend himself and why he defends himself to them, and then we're going to look at how we can be a blessing to our ministers, how we can pray for them, and I'll give you a little insight into that. We want to be one of the people that prays for, supports, encourages our ministers instead of one of the people who is a pain to them, runs them down. All right, so 1 Corinthians 9. Paul says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? For if to others I am not apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So there were some people at Corinth who were saying, Paul's not really an apostle. These other people, they're apostles, they're leaders, but not Paul. Now, if, you, if the enemy attacks Paul and says he's not apostle, then you don't have to listen to him. You don't have to listen to his, his directions, his teachings. You have other people that are above him, and some of those were actually probably false apostles. They were no comparison to Paul. And Paul is the founder of the church and, and basically apostle to this church and to this area. He gets to set and set up the church and set the guidelines for the church. And if you can attack his leadership, then you can undermine a lot of what God is doing there. So Paul has to defend himself. Why is he defending himself? Does he feel like personally wounded? Like, I've got to defend myself sometimes like we do? No. He's doing this for the sake of the gospel. He's not doing this because he needs to defend himself. He doesn't need to defend himself. He knows that. God is his judge, but he needs to defend his leadership so that they can understand, you need to follow me. You need to listen to me. All right, verse 3. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take a believing wife along with us, as the other apostles do, and the Lord, and Cephas, or Peter? Or is it only I and Barnabas who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same thing? For in, it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox out while it's treading the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? For it is written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher should thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. 
If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we re reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not share it even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Check out that phrase there. We endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. That's how they eat. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who preach the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So Paul sets up here a great precedent as Old Testament and New Testament that people who serve in the temple or preach the gospel should live off that. In other words, the congregation should be taking care of them. Now Paul says, I didn't do this. Now, maybe this was something they were attacking him with. He's not a real apostle. He didn't take money from us. You know, people always find some crazy thing to criticize you about. Paul says, I have every right to receive money from you. In the Old Testament times, and when people served in the temple, they lived off those sacrifices. Not all those sacrifices were complete burnt offerings. They were made in the temple, but they, the priest ate them. That's how they lived. That's how they survived. And he uses... a. Uh, illustrations from the natural realm. It says a farmer goes out and plows. He's plowing in hope that I'm going to have a harvest one day. Thresher, thresher, he threshes in hope that I'm going to have, you know, some grain. And so Paul says, look, as ministers of the gospel, we go out and it is right and it is just for you to take care of us. That's what God has commanded. Those who proclaim the gospel should get their living from the gospel. But Paul says, starting with verse 15, I've not made use of any of these rights. Nor am I writing to you so that you will do such things for me. But I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no round for, for boasting because a necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Underline that phrase. Woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For I do this on my own will. I have a reward, but it's not of my own will. I am still entrusting with a stewardship. So what then is my reward? It's not financial, obviously, that in preaching the gospel, I may present the gospel free of charge so as to not make full use of my right in the gospel. So Paul says, look, the reason why I don't take money, because I know that for some people that could be some sort of a stumbling block in their mind. I want to always offer the gospel to people free of charge. I don't want anybody to be able to look at me and say, this guy's doing it in it for the money. Do we have preachers today that are in it for the money? Boss teachers. Mm -hmm. And some of them, they're a little messed up in their, in their thinking, too. I've said this before. I'll say it again. I think it is a sin for a minister to become a millionaire off people's ties or a multimillionaire. A million's not much anymore. But I think it's a sin. Now, you sell a book, and people buy it. That's different. Okay? People are paying for the book, $10, $20, something like that. But to take God's people's ties and become a multimillionaire, that's wrong. Paul says, look, I am not taking a cent from you. Now, he did from other churches. Sometimes other churches volunteered and gave him money so that he could serve. Other times he worked. He, he was a tent maker. He provided for himself. Him and his companions did. But one thing you see here is that Paul had trouble just like every other leader, every other Christian leader has ever had since the beginning of time. He was no exception. All the way back to Moses. Did Moses have to put up with some complaining, nagging people? Yes. Okay, what about the prophets? They got killed. Jesus, same thing. They killed Jesus. Paul's no different. You would think the great apostle Paul, if Paul came today, wouldn't he be treated with respect in all the churches? Wouldn't we just be, uh, he'd be like a superstar. We'd love to go see him. Or would he be treated the same way ministers are today? Probably treated the same way ministers are today, right? Probably. Do you think they would make an exception for Paul? They don't make an exception for their own minister. Roast preacher for lunch. You can't change someone's heart. See, someone's heart's not going to change regardless of who the leader is. One of my ministries throughout my life has seemed to be to minister to ministers. So I was called to ministry in college. had a lot of friends who were going into the ministry. Went to seminary. had a lot of friends who were going into the ministry. I keep in touch with them. And I always try whatever church God sends me to to try to if I can, I haven't done it in this church because it's so big, but minister to the ministers. Serve them, pray for them, encourage them. It's a big ministry. Ministers need to be ministered to. There's a lot of Sunday nights I've been on the phone with a minister friend who's just pouring out his heart to me. Somebody said something. I've sat in ministers' offices before where they couldn't even lift their head up and look me in the eye 
They were so discouraged. Now, I think it is one of the greatest tools of Satan to wound and discourage a minister through their own flock. Think about it. What better way to get at him than the people who he loves the most and cares for the most, people he's pouring his life into? And it doesn't really any good. It doesn't do any good to plan a lesson or a sermon for these people because they think they're doing God's will. They really do. I mean, you can preach a sermon about respecting your minister and giving him double honor and all this, unless he's, you know, committing some heinous sin, leave him alone, encourage him, pray for him. It doesn't apply to them. They are so deceived, they actually think they're doing God's will by criticizing, correcting their own minister. It's crazy. 1 Timothy 5.17 says this, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, not just honor, Double honor, especially those who labor at work at preaching and teaching. I was talking to a minister friend about a month ago. He goes, Cliff, I got no problem with God. I'm doing good. People are driving me crazy. <laughs> I'm fine with the Lord. I'm walking in obedience. I'm having good quiet times. But these people, are, mm, that's why I have the problem. Bible says our ministers should be treated with double honor. If you were to go up to a minister and say, does this, is this church or how many churches you've been in have treated you with double honor? Most of them would say, mm, maybe a single with cheese. <laughs> you know, probably not a double honor. There is a suffering involved in the ministry that they can't really teach you in seminary. They teach you about the Bible, they teach you about facts, and they did try to somewhat. I mean, older ministers would say, say to us, if you're going to the ministry, you better get alligator skin, you better get tough skin. I understood what they meant later. I never was able to do that. I never had an alligator skin. Everything always hurt me. It hurt me when they hurt my friends as well. I did learn through the years, though, to forgive and love and pray for those people. And I learned to keep my mouth shut as well. Don't need to defend myself or defend anyone else because it's not going to do any good anyway. But there's a suffering involved in the ministry. And unfortunately, a lot of that time, a lot of that comes from your own flock. Check this out. Every minister could say amen to this. This verse right here. It's in Psalm 109, including Paul. Psalm 109, verses, verse 4. It says, In return for my love, they accuse me. This is David. But I give myself to prayer. In return for my love, they accuse me. But I give myself to prayer. There's no ministers in the room because I don't hear an amen. <laughs> but that's what they deal with. That's just part of the job. And it's the hardest part. Of the job. The hardest part of the job is, is just dealing with your own flock. I mean, and sometimes there's wolves within the flock. They're not all sheep, but sheep bite too. Trust me. Okay, now Galatians 1.10. Paul says, Am I now seeking to win the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You know you can't please everybody anyway, right? Paul says, Look, I'm not trying to please man. I'm trying to please God. God is my judge. And he will judge me. And I, I wouldn't even be a servant of Christ if I'm trying to please man. I've taken no money. I'm just doing God's will. I'm saving you from hell. I'm discipling you. I'm teaching you free of charge. And you attack me. Listen, I'm going to say this a couple times so it gets into your brain. Your teachers, your ministers, your preachers don't need your criticism. They need your love and encouragement. I'm going to say it again. They don't need our criticism. Does that mean they're perfect? Our minister's perfect? No, absolutely not. But they don't need your criticism. They don't need your judgment. They need your encouragement and your love. Aren't we supposed to hold people accountable? Sure, okay, if it's a heinous thing, of course. But you better think long and hard. You feel like you want to rebuke somebody, go find a mirror, start there. Listen, I'm telling you this because Paul dealt with it, Moses dealt with it, Jesus dealt with it. We all deal with it. It's a so part of any teacher will tell you they deal with it as well. It's, I told you this week was punching bag week. <laughs> it's everlasting punching bag. I was like, at the end of the week, I was like, this is teacher appreciation week? <laughs> what in the world? It was, it was insane. Uh, wow. 1 Corinthians 9. Um, let's look at the second half now, okay? 16 through 27. Now, it's important to remember, first of all, was was Paul perfect? He wasn't either. A lot of people think he was. Well, his theology in the Bible was perfect, and that's about it. He wasn't perfect. You want me to be real with you? So I was in seminary. I was in seminary, and uh, we were, my, my bed hurt, hurt me. I, I lived in the men's dorm at seminary. 
my bed was hurt my back so i need a little more cushion so my buddy and i went into an empty dorm room and to get a mattress out we picked it up the mattress and we moved it back into my room and we looked and there was a playboy magazine under the mattress in an empty dorm room in seminary and he goes don't put your eyes on it he grabbed it we threw it in the trash can real fast <laughs> I didn't tell many people that, but I told a couple people, and they were like, oh my goodness, somebody in seminary, are you kidding me? I said, look, I've had multiple friends on the seminary tell me they struggle with pornography. A minister is just someone just like you that God says, I want you in seminary. What? Me? Maybe this guy wasn't even on staff at a church yet. Maybe he was just going to school. Maybe God was still working in his life. Was it wrong? Absolutely, it was wrong. There's no doubt about that. But you start thinking people are perfect, and your leaders are perfect? No. Uh, the reason why we can idolize like these people in history, like John Calvin, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, or <clears throat> maybe someone you watch on the internet, oh, yeah, that's my favorite preacher, because you don't know them. If you, know, if you knew them, you find out they're a sinner just like you. So if I walked up to George Whitfield, maybe I wouldn't like him as much as I thought. Maybe he wouldn't give me the time. But I don't know. I just know he's a sinner. Well, See, here's the problem. Sometimes we all have different weaknesses, right? Your weakness may not be lust or pornography. So you're like, oh, that horrible. But you may be prideful. You may be arrogant. You may not have people skills. So let's not set people up on a pedestal. Let's pray for people. Being honest and real, I had a friend who was a lady. She was a counselor. She specialized in, in pastoral counseling. That's what she did. She said, Cliff, when the Internet came out, my office is full of pastors struggling with pornography, full, all the time. They need our prayers, okay? They need our prayers. Should it be that way? No, absolutely not. But we need to love them, encourage them. We need to bear their armor. We need to pray for them. Now, Paul talks about, about this and his struggle at the end of this and how he, how he deals with this and at the end of 1 Corinthians 9. But let's kind of switch gears here. Let's get a little more positive and look at how he does evangelism. Okay, check this out. He says, first of all, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Paul says, I was saved. I was called. I was on my way to kill Christians. And God gave, showed me grace. He had to blind me. And God gave me grace. How could I not then go proclaim the gospel? Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Can we say that about ourselves? Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel because God has saved me. He has shown me grace. How can I deny this grace to others? Look, y'all, it's kind of like the Titanic is sunk and people are in the water and we got a lifeboat and we're on it. Let's not take our lifeboats and go have a lifeboat huddle somewhere. Let's go out in the people, in the midst of the people, and let's row out there. My buddy was my prayer partner in seminary, the one who lifted up the mattress with me. He spent his whole career as an undercover missionary in the, in the 1040 window in a Muslim country, uh, him and his family. I spent my whole career as an undercover missionary across the street in a public school. Two different locations, two different places, led by God, planned by God. Uh, but this guy was, he, he was incredible at preaching the gospel. He was incredible at sharing the gospel. He, he moved out of seminary, out of the dorm room, and moved into a low-income housing complex, a place that you and I probably wouldn't even want to live or even want to walk through. He moved there and lived there. They gave him an apartment. He just ministered to the kids, ministered to people, led people to Christ. The dude lived for the gospel. Right? He even took his family to a Muslim country to live his whole life there to share the good news. We have been given so much grace. Woe to us if we don't share this grace. We've got a lifeboat, y'all. We can get people in. Now, the problem with the difference is people in the Titanic knew they were drowning. Our people don't always know they're drowning. But some of them do, and some of them are desperate. Paul says, verse 17, I've been entrusted with a stewardship. I've been giving something. I've been entrusted with this good news. And I should be worthy. I should take care of this. I should guard the trust. Now look at his strategy here, verse 19. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more of them. All right, Paul says, look, I'm free. Christ has set me free, but I make myself a slave. How many of us want to make ourselves slaves? I make myself a slave to who? To everyone, so that I can win more of them. What is secular winning? Paul talks, uses this word win a lot here. What is secular winning versus spiritual winning? You know, our society is very focused on secular winning. 
our team is better than your team. I mean, it drives our whole society. Our company is better than your company. Our company is number one. Always striving to beat someone else. Always striving to beat someone else down. Always striving to win. That's secular winning. Spiritual winning is when you win someone to Christ. Or when you say no to sin. And yes to God. That's a spiritual win. That's what Paul was concerned about. He says, I want to win people to the Lord. And to do that, I become their servant. So, when we go share the gospel with people, we approach them as their servant. That changes your mindset, right? So if they don't want it, you just back off and you pray for them right? because you're their servant. Check out these stats. I, these stats show exactly and they show us and demonstrate to us what Jesus said when he said the fields are ready for harvest. American Bible Society. I used to get a lot of tracts from them. They give out Bibles too. Uh, this is in the Southern Baptist Texan magazine. Great magazine. You can get it for free. We pay for it with your tithe money. It's sitting out on the missions table. It comes out, I think, every month. Yep, you can grab one. It's all about church starts, church plants, people winning people to Christ in Texas. This is a great magazine, very encouraging. I found this little, found these statistics here in it. Powerful statistics demonstrate exactly what Jesus said. 18% of Americans are regularly Bible engaged. That's a pretty good number, I thought. Close to 20% of Americans say they're Bible engaged. But check this out. This is the one that got me. 68% of Americans surveyed today say they are very or extremely interested in the Bible. Is that what the devil wants you to think about the lost world? That they are very, extremely interested? 68%. That's the majority, y'all. That's a super majority. When we go out to witness, a maj- over 50% of the people say they're very or extremely interested. Only 3% said they're not interested at all. I told you, when you go out witness, most people will listen to you. Only 3% said they're not interested at all. That means that 97% of the people we talk to or give a track to or love on and invite to church are at least somewhat interested. 97%. So if you're getting groceries and that person bringing up your groceries, God tells you to give a track to them, there's a 97% chance that they'll read that track. They're at least somewhat interested. And that track has the Word of God in it. Maybe tracks are not for you. Maybe you share your testimony. Maybe you put it out on social media. But 97% of the people that hear your testimony are at least somewhat interested. That's why Jesus said the fields are ready for harvest. We have to pray for workers in the harvest field. That's the answer. Workers in the harvest field. Now, Paul says here, I become a servant to everyone. We don't want to approach someone with a, I'm going to get a little notch on my belt for witnessing to you. I'm going to make myself feel better about myself because I'm going to go witness. We approach someone as their servant. We are serving them with the gospel, and that changes everything. It changes the way we approach people, the way we talk to people, the way we love people. We come up to them as their servant, trying to convince them to get on the lifeboat with us, explaining to them the things that they're already saying. Most of them are very or extremely interested in, trying to answer their questions, being a servant. Don't be offended by their questions. Their questions are legitimate for them. Try to help them understand. Paul says, To the Jews, I became a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though myself am not under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. He uses that word over and over, win. Win, win. What's a win to Paul? It's a soul. It's not a game. I have become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. Notice he doesn't save all. He knows he can't save all. But he can't save some. To do that, though, he has to become all things to all men. In other words, when he's around the Greeks, he acts like a Greek. He's around the Jews, he puts himself under the Jewish law. He's free. He gives up his own freedoms. He sacrifices his own freedoms to win others. When I did missionary training at the, with the IMB, uh, they trained us alongside the career missionaries. And it's kind of cool. You get to fellowship with them a little bit. The journeymen go out for two years, and they do a two-week training. At the same time, the career missionaries go for a six-week training. That's the way it was when we went out. So you get to all train together, and you get some different speakers and things come in. And they do a pretty good job of training you. One thing that they really did a good job of training us on was being an incarnational minister. 
And they give us the whole history of missions. When the new modern mission movement started, a lot of people went out and they imposed their English culture, or in some cases American culture, on these other tribes and around the world. In other words, instead of just sharing the gospel with them, they also tried to make them English Christians or American Christians. You know, set up an educational system for them, taught them this, you got to do this, things this way, this is how we do communion. They, they kind of imposed the culture on them instead of letting them become tribal Christians and keep a lot of their tribal things that were, they, they didn't know what incarnational ministry meant. So they explain that to us, like God became man, you're going to have to become, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, all things to all people. They said, you're going to have to leave your American Christianity here. And you'll understand what we mean when, I get, when you get out there. Because there's some things that you think in American Christianity are just, they're part of, of Christianity. They're really not. They're part of American Christianity or Southern Baptist Christianity. And you're going to have to lose some of those things because they ain't going to fly on the mission field. They were right. So one thing I noticed is in Ireland, the methods. You can't use the methods in Ireland. You can here. In, in Ireland, they have this big Protestant Catholic thing, which is rooted in the British-Irish thing. Basically, what happens is the, the, the English took Northern Ireland from the Irish, and they populated it with Scottish uh, peasants. So they moved Scottish people over and gave them the land to hold the land. So there's been animosity for centuries between the British and the Irish. Right? That's what all the troubles and everything else were. So you can't go up to someone on the streets of Ireland and witness. You really can't. I did it one time. I wasn't thinking, I guess. I was at a stoplight. I felt like God wanted me to talk to this girl. I said, hey, do you talk about God and Jesus? And she ran, literally ran from me. And I didn't realize till later, dude, you're in Belfast. If you're a Protestant or you're a Catholic and you're in the wrong neighborhood, you can get shot like that. You can't go street with, you can't walk up to someone in the city center and say, are you Protestant or Catholic? They're going to fear for their life. They're not going to tell you. They're not going to have a conversation with you. So how did we do evangelism then? Well, we opened up, uh, we bought this hall, we opened it up, we turned it into a basically non-alcoholic pub. You could play pool, you could play darts, you could play table tennis, ping pong. We invited the kids in from the community. We shared the gospel with them. They got saved. They could buy Cokes instead of beers or Guinness or whatever. And we were incarnational with them. We created a little kid's pub. Right? That's how they hang out in Britain. They go to the pub. Right? And they had a little, a little candy shop where you could buy candy. And it was fun. The kids loved it. We built relationships with them. It was incarnational. That's how we did evangelism. That's how they got saved. Is through a method that was very different from what we used here. You can't do street evangelism in Belfast. Maybe you can a little more now, but... Not like them. Here's another thing to get you. Theology. I tell you this. Your theology is going to have to be set aside too. So when I got over there, I realized that these people immediately just started hitting me with five-point Calvinism. I didn't know much about Calvinism. I didn't know anything about Calvinism when I got over there. But they're very influenced by the Presbyterians. That's the major denomination of Northern Ireland. So the Baptists, a lot of the Baptists are five-point Calvinists. And I'm a, I was raised in America, free will, American. You know, if you go to hell, it's on you. You know, just kind of that mindset. I was clueless. So they're teaching me about predestination and all this stuff, and I'm trying to wrap my head around it. And I remember this theology, <laughs> theology. Now, practically, it didn't make that big of a difference. It was just their theology, but I had to adjust myself to their theology. I couldn't say things that I know would set them off, right? Head coverings. Most of the women in the church wore head coverings. I remember having a comment, uh, a little conversation with the youth minister's wife once. Like, that's kind of, you know, that was for the first time. Oh, no, that's in the Bible. It's in the New Testament. You can't say. I was like, oh, yeah, Cliff, back off. It's not a major thing. It's not about the cross. It's not about the blood. It's not about salvation. If she wants to wear a head covering to honor her husband and honor her Lord at church, it's straight out of the Bible. Back off. Theology, right? I also found out that the European Baptists are not Southern Baptists. They don't have Southern Baptist theology. Most of them don't believe one saved, always saved. So it was different. The Lord's Supper, different. They did the Lord's Supper every Sunday after church. They had their own service. All the guests had to leave. Mm -hmm. Leave the church. This is for the believers. This is for the members. Come to the Lord's table. And we had a, a whole other 20-minute service around the Lord's table. Well... A lot of our kids, you know, they weren't Christians yet, so they come to church, but they go hang outside the church. And I decided one day I would go 
hang out with the kids outside and do some evangelism, you know, hang out with them. So they come to the table. Well, someone made it clear to me that as a believer, I needed to be at that table, not hanging out with the kids at that time. It didn't really rebuke me that much. It just encouraged me, you know. People in the church see you with the unbelievers during the Lord's table. You're commanded to come to the table in the New Testament. All right. And we only did it like once a quarter back home, not every Sunday. They did it every Sunday. That's what they did. Even pronouncing things. I had to change the way I talked. I was talking to this one older deacon. He goes, I can't, when you preach, I can't stand the way you say God. Oh, I, oh, I can't stand it. It's gold. It's an O. Gold. So I, <laughs> so I, had, to, I had to change the way I said God. Because they say I say God. Gold. Gold. So I always refer to gold. So I'd have to make fun of them in my own mind to kind of make it understand. <laughs> Incarnational ministry. When in Ireland, do things as the Irish do. I didn't change the gospel, didn't change the good news, didn't change the cross, didn't change repentance, didn't change the way to salvation, but I changed the method of evangelism. Hey, listen, methods of evangelism, I think, have changed since the social media has come around. I've noticed that people are less likely to engage in the conversation with you, but they're more likely to listen to something on social media. They're more personal now, uh, but... I, like I told you, I can't keep tracks on my desk at work, on my table at work. They take them. Will they come up to me and have a conversation? No, but they're taking things and they're personally reading them. I think social media has done that. So doing something on social media with people is very powerful. So that's, that's probably the way they would prefer to hear the gospel, listening to a sermon instead of listening to you talk to them. Things have changed. Before cell phones and social media, we'd go out and talk to people all the time. That was the only way you could really communicate the gospel with people, and people would talk to us. I notice people are a little more suspicious now when, they, when you talk to them. But they will take a track, or they will look at something on social media, or they will listen to a sermon themselves. They, it's so, so personal to them. That's a method change. It's a method shift that we're seeing in our society because of phones and social media. So methods will change through the years. And even your theology sometimes needs to be set aside so that the essential things, the main things, love, the gospel, the good news, compassion, humility, all those things can come to the front. Incarnational ministry. Last thing, Paul realized this mission required self-discipline. Paul says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. Then he finishes with this. I love this part of 1 Corinthians 9. Do you not know in a race that all runners run. There were some Olympic games that happened in Athens every year, but a lot of people also know there was another Olympic games that happened in Corinth. Corinth was a center of a, of a Greek Olympic games. These people obviously attended those. And he says, you all know that in a race, the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Only one's on the podium with the little wreath on his head. So run so that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. When they get up, what they eat, how they exercise, how they stretch, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. These people will go into all kinds of training to get a little thing of grass on top of their head to be number one. They'll, go, they'll put their body through all kinds of discipline and pain and self-discipline in order to get this little wreath on their head, perishable. But listen, y'all, when we do that, when we discipline our body, when we go into strict discipline, what we say, what we eat, who we hanging out with, how much we read our Bible, how we pray, how we attend church, our devotional life, our fasting, our prayer, all that stuff, when we do all that stuff, we do it for an imperishable reward, for God giving us something that's an eternal reward. We don't do it in vain. Paul says, when I run, I don't run aimlessly. I just don't run around crazy. Well, I, I do not box as like one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself would be disqualified. Paul knew that I could preach the gospel and lead people to Christ and then go disqualify myself because of my private sin. Have preachers done that through the years? Have they disqualified themselves? Have they lost their family and their church and their ministry because they can't control themselves? Yes. So what is this self-control that we need? 
it is very difficult to live inside this body. Amen. Anybody else looking forward to get rid of it one day and get a new body with the right desires? Something we could witness to people about, we, especially when you're talking to people that have a tendency to homosexuality or transgender or whatever, you, you, could, you could propose this question to them. Is it possible that not all of our desires that we have are actually good for us, are actually good desires? You don't have to preach at them, but you can just propose that question. Is it possible? I mean, if someone hurts you, do, do you want to hit them in the face? Is that a good desire? You see a beautiful woman who's married and you want to sleep with her, is that, is that a good desire? If you want to eat and, eat and overeat and overeat and get, get fat and get overweight, is that a good desire your body has? So, you ever wanted to just kill somebody, hope they were dead? Not all of our desires are godly or good for us. That's something we can just propose to people. Let them think about it. Because the world tells them all your desires are good for you. And they're not. They're not good. And they're not good for you. And you can give them examples. And just propose that and let the Lord go to work with them. Even a preacher can be disqualified for the prize. Uh, private sin damages public ministry. We can't give our body everything at once. Our body wants food. Our body wants sex. Our body wants this and that. We can't give it everything at once. Not all of our desires are good for us. So I love the end of 1 Corinthians 9 here because Paul then, after telling you, defending his apostleship, telling you his strategy and how he wins people, Talking about incarnational ministry. Talk about his goal is to win people to Christ. Remember, at the end of the day, that's all that matters, right? Who's going to heaven and who's going to hell? Isn't that really all that matters at the end of the day? How much money we have or how big our house is or all this other stuff. That really doesn't matter. You're not going to be married in heaven. You're not, it's not going to be about money or houses or cars in heaven. It's going to be about who's there and who's not there. Paul understood the most important thing. Keep the mission the most important thing in your life. And you can endure everything else for the sake of the mission, the goal. And Paul at the end turns it inward and says, and after I've preached, I still got some work to do. I can't relax. In fact, I it, the literally he says, I have to beat my body and make it my slave because I can be disqualified because I'm a human being just like everyone else. I have to discipline and bring it under control. So, the mission requires self-discipline. The mission requires self-control. And what we think, what we see, what we eat, how we speak, what the condition of our heart, what we read, what we pray, all things. Listen, these people in the Olympics, these Olympic athletes, I mean, professional athletes, are they're pretty dedicated to their craft, but Olympic athletes, they're on a whole new level. When you're trying to be number one in the world at something, these guys get up at three, four in the morning, practice for three hours before they go to school, go to school, study, and come back to practice for eight more hours, and they do it six days a week, some of them seven days a week. For what? For what? To make it to the Olympics, to have a gold thing put around their neck. Paul says, look, if these people can do that for something that's eternally meaningless, can't we do the same thing for something that's meaningful? Can't we get up early and spend some time with the Lord before we go to work? Can't we discipline ourselves and turn the TV off and read the Bible or put our phone down and spend time with the Lord? You need to do what you need to do to get close to God. There was two days this week after work, I couldn't speak. <laughs> Just telling you, I couldn't even speak. Like, I did not need to be around people right now. I need to go home. I need to read my Bible. I walk, took a walk in a park. Saw some Christian friends that I hadn't seen in a long time. Talked to them at the park. But I just need to get with the Lord. I, need, I understood where I was at emotionally. And I understood I don't need to be around anybody right now. I need to be with Jesus. You have to kind of get yourself to the point where you realize the most important thing in your life is your relationship with Christ. And then what's after that? The mission. The mission. Are we winning people to Christ? So I said this before, I'll say it again. Your job is not your main job. Your job is your secondary job. Your main job is to win people to Christ, to be an ambassador for Christ. So let's learn. We're not perfect yet. I'm not perfect. None of us are. We're all in process. Turn me that little cube there. So I keep this on my desk. It's called an Avenger cube. You can buy them at Mardell's. You can order them online. I just keep them on the corner of my desk. And when you turn it, it shares the gospel, and it's a visual. And the kids love it because of the visual part of it, and it's a great way to share the gospel. So I keep it on the corner of my desk. It's kind of like 
bait, right? You go fishing, you got to put out the bait first. So if it's a bait out there, I leave it on the corner of my desk. And if a kid comes up and starts turning that thing, that's a green light, baby. Okay? I don't sit there and go, hey, put that thing down. It's mine. They come up and start playing with it. I jump on it. Hey, have I shared this with you? This is people. This is God. I never had a kid say, walk away. I've, every single kid has waited until the whole thing is over. And the last picture, I like the last picture. It's Jesus. You can come look at it afterwards. It's Jesus reaching out his hand. He's got a scar in his hand. He's reaching out his hand and grabbing us. And there's hell fires at the bottom. And he's pulling us up to heaven. I say, right now, Jesus is reaching out to save us from hell and bring us to heaven. That's the closing picture. Um, actually, there's one more about asking Christ into your life and the Holy Spirit coming inside of you. Every single person I've ever shared that with will let me share the whole plan of salvation. It's just a little bait. You don't have to use it. It's effective for me. I use it. It works. We've got to find some way to get the good news out there because that is our number one job. Love your ministers. Love your teachers. Pray for them. Intercede for them. Care for them. Remember, we're all human. We're all imperfect. What's our job? What's our mission? To be a servant to everyone. To share the gospel with everyone we can. To pray for them. To discipline ourselves. Discipline our body. Bring it under control for the sake of the call. For the sake of the Lord. For the sake of the mission. We don't want to be disqualified from the love, the joy, the peace, the patience that is ours when we obey the Lord. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. It's been a week, Lord, you know it, but I thank you for refining. I thank you for testing. I thank you for everything you put us through, Lord, so that uh, we could be more like you. And we all need discipline. We all need trials. And, uh, and your word says, uh, it was good for me to be afflicted, and then I might learn your commands. Uh, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. Lord, <laughs> none of us are perfect. We're far from it. Uh, forgive us for making idols of people who are really just like us. Um, Father, help us to be on mission with you. We know, Jesus, you came to seek and to save the lost. So give us this mindset, Lord. Give us this heart. At the end of the day, that's all that really matters. We get upset about things that don't really matter. What really matters, Lord, is how many people can we get on our lifeboat? And I pray that you would use my, my life the rest of my life as you see fit to get as many people as we can on this lifeboat. Jesus, we just present ourselves to you, Lord. We say, here my send me. Open our eyes to the people around us. And most of all, Lord, open our hearts to them. Father, I know my heart can be so hard toward people. I don't even see them. I don't see them like you see them. I don't love them like you love them. Help us, Lord. Soften our hearts. Help us to see people, care for people, weep for people, pray for people, Lord. Thank you for this, this lesson, this time we were able to spend on evangelism. Help us to continue to grow in this area, Lord, to be your servants the rest of our life, to be on mission with you. And there's nothing like it. There's nothing like being on mission with you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Pray for our staff that you would bless them, protect them, encourage them. They got targets on their back. Lord, protect them from the enemy. Protect them from the evil one. Help us to be an encourager to them, an encouragement to them, a blessing to them, Lord God. Thank you for our staff. Thank you for giving us such godly people here at this church. Speak to us today through the worship service. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth. Give us your presence, Lord. And help us this week to have a little revival in our life, a little spiritual awakening in our life. Help us to to pray more, to worship more, to draw near to you more, to suffer well for you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for entrusting us with the gospel, Lord. Thank you for this privilege we have, Lord, this honor of sharing eternal life with people. Thank you for the power of the gospel, Lord. We love you. Thank you for this class. Thank you for each one in it. Bless them. Show them how much you love them. Help us to love one another, encourage one another, build one another up. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. If this week's message helped you, feel free to share it with a friend. At Common Grounds, we are striving to help people grow in their faith and build community by finding common ground in Christ Jesus. Until next time, hope you all have a great week.